Um, great. So we are actually already over 100 attendants, which I think is great. It shows that there is a great interest in process tracing and what we have to offer here. And we hope we can live up to uh, your expectations and actually introduce you just a little bit to this method. An hour is really short. Um, Derek just mentioned the summer schools where we where we have two weeks. So we have two consecutive weeks of teaching where we actually just teach this method. And now we're going to try and put that all in one hour. What we're going to do, just very briefly, um, is we're going to go over process tracing as a case-based method. That will be me. Uh, and what are we tracing? The simple answer is going to be causal mechanisms. Um, and then Derek is going to take over and say, how do we trace it? So what is evidence, essentially, and uh, about case selection and generalizations? So going in there, I want to start with a simple statement that is really should really be non-controversial. I think everybody here would just immediately agree to, and that is the fact that a correlation is not causation. But it's important to say that here because one, what we're going to do is kind of, we hope we explain why correlation is not causation, but also how process tracing is actually going to help us overcome this idea of correlations. So process tracing is specifically about going beyond correlations and studying the process, the causal mechanism that connects variables. So have a look at this graph. This graph depicts a near perfect correlation between worldwide non-commercial space launches and sociology doctorates awarded in the United States. Now, this is the type of correlation where we know it's just a correlation. We know this is coincidence. Why? Because we cannot really fathom or come up with a credible theory that would connect these two um, variables. Yet, if you look at this type of research, a correlation-based research, that is essentially what we do, right? We have a correlation, and then we say what the theory is, how these would theoretically plausibly be connected. But the difficulty here is that no matter how many data points or cases you would add to the correlation, that's also the case if you do case-based correlations, I'll get to that, you would never get at the how. You would never get at how these two variables are then related. You would only re-establish the correlation. And so that essentially is where process tracing comes in, right? It is a within-case method that wants to open up that case to really look inside and say, how do these two things relate? If it's more than a correlation, then where is that causation hiding? And that causation is generally hiding at this within-case level. This is where this whole, I'm sure you've heard of this, this metaphor of opening the black box of causation. Derek, I'm sure in every one of your publications, this must be in there somewhere, right? talking about the black box, uh, opening the black box of causation. So that's what process tracing does. And we're going to show you, we're going to just try and show you how that can be done and what that means. But first, um, I do assume, and this is my assumption, that most of you are either students, bachelor or master students, or you're right now PhD candidates at a university somewhere. And I think many of you are probably engaged or looking into some form of cross-case analysis, right? So you have two cases, maybe three cases that you're interested in studying, crisis that you're going to compare, countries that you're going to compare, regions that you're going to compare. Now, cross-case in this sense are just correlations in small. And I'm going to use the Winward article to briefly show you what I mean with that. Now, we forwarded the Winward article, um, and I hope you did read it, but if you didn't read it, don't worry. I'm going to try and explain the best as I can um, to kind of say what he's doing in there. Um, but what you would then can do afterwards is just go and read that article. We're going to post this video so you can come back to it and then see if you can then follow the interpretation. Might actually be the perfect way to first listen, then read, and then listen again. Um, but essentially what he does is the following. And note that it's even, it's, it's published in a comparative journal. So this journal is explicitly about comparative cases and he does this if you, and this is my interpretation of what he's done, right? So what we have is essentially three cases. Um, so he goes inside Indonesia and then within Indonesia, even deeper in at the level of Java and then splits it up in East, Central and Western Java. And these are the three cases that he compares. And it's a correlation in first instance because what he looks at is two variables. And that is on the one hand, um, intelligence capacity and on the other hand, pre-existing political cleavages, the argument being specifically that low intelligence capacity uh, and pre-existing political cleavages lead to high levels of violence. How that works, we're going to get there in a second when we look at this mechanism. But if you look at this, just this table set up this way, it's essentially a perfect comparative case study where we compare two variables and how they correlate with the outcome. 
And here we also see that if we have low intelligence capacity, as is the case in East Java and Central Java, we have high levels of violence, whereas if we have high levels of intelligence capacity, we have low levels of violence. It is essentially a correlation. So how then does process tracing, what does process tracing do to allow us to overcome, get deeper, get closer to what causation is actually about? And that is what Windward, um, so the, the question then, how, right? How do these variable, variables relate? And what Windward then does, and it's interesting, he says, well, let me actually pick out one of these cases, the case of Central Java, and study that in much more detail, right? So to open up the case and really look what was going on, who was doing what, so which actors were engaging in what type of activities that then actually caused, brought about this particular outcome of high levels of violence. And that is the major difference with process tracing, that it really asks how questions. So it's not about um, how certain variables relate, it's really about Oh, it's, it is about how they relate, not that they relate, which is what you get with correlation analysis, but how they relate, um, which is very different from the under what conditions question. If you would look at the former table, this is really an under what conditions type of question. If you would only, if you would stop here, you would have the answer, under what conditions do we see high levels of categorical violence? And the answer would be, well, under low in intelligence capacity and pre-existing political cleavages. But it doesn't answer the how question. And process tracing wants to get at that how question. How do things come about? We're going to get there. Um, what we do then see is that this, in this case for, for Windward, Central Java is a case study. It becomes a case. And what is then a case? A case is an instance of your causal relationship. So working a bit still with my assumption that you are probably right now engaged in some form of process tracing or comparative research, I'm quite sure your researcher or your um, supervisor at some point asked you, so what is your case a case of? This is one of the questions you probably get very, very frequently. And the answer is always that your case is a case of your causal theory. Of It's an instantiation of the theory that you're interested. It's an instantiation of the relation that you're interested in studying. And if you're doing process tracing, it is essentially an instance where we see your trigger triggering a particular mechanism or a process leading to a, per, uh, a given outcome. And, and this is something that is not always emphasized uh, that clearly, generally would say this happens within particular scope conditions. And I'm gonna get back to this when we look at Windward's actual uh, mechanism, how that works. So if the question to you is asked, what is your case a case of? The answer would always be, it's a case of your causal theory. This does mean, and this is something that is not always explicated that we're here talking about, and I'm going to see how Derek is going to react because he also doesn't always explicate this, um, is that we're essentially talking about irregularity based approach to process tracing. The idea being that mechanisms underlie a bounded but regular association. And we see this in Windward, right? He picks the case of Central Java, but it's under the assumption that the same mechanism plays out in East Java and probably plays out in other places where we see the two conditions of low intelligence capacity and pre-existing political cleavages in place. So, and this is how we can then theorize, and actually uh, maybe in the system we'll see, because Jer Derek is gonna talk about generalizations as well, right? where we could essentially generalize from one case to another case that exists under the same conditions. Now, another question that you're probably gonna ask, or at least, so I'm, an international relations scholar, and there the question always comes up. So yeah, but what level of analysis are you here talking about? And the nice thing with process tracing is that it's perfectly agnostic. If you can essentially, any theory can be cast in terms of a process, and it doesn't matter which level of analysis this is. So as an international relations scholar, I would generally study uh, states and state interactions, right? So you have the international system as kind of the space in which processes plays out, play out, and then you have states interacting and those could be processes. You could, however, also be interested in individual level processes. Specifically, if you're interested, for instance, in political psychology, you might be interested in how an individual reacted in a particular case and what they did to actually cause and bring about a particular outcome. Um, Winward is interested in something that's kind of in between. He's not on the state level, he's not on the individual level, but he's kind of on an intermediate meso level where he's looking at regional, um, in this case, within a country, so region, uh, within a country, provinces, if you will, 
um, at that level he's looking, but still a collective actors. So we'll see that he's talking about security forces and elites. So it's not individuals, but neither is it at a more macro state level. Um, process tracing can also be done at any point in time. Historical cases can be process tracing cases, right? You can have contemporary cases. There is, however, one caveat that I would mention here, and that is that process tracing is a post hoc method. That is to say that the outcome, the outcome of interest must have already occurred before we can actually start pro study, studying the process that led up to it. Um, because if the outcome is still unclear, then the question is, what are we process tracing towards? Right? If you're process tracing towards a moving target, you can't really fix uh, what it is that you'd be interested in, what it is that you're explaining. So process tracing is not time specific. It can be done at any point in time in relation to any case, however old it is, with one caveat that it is, I would say at least, post hoc. So the outcome must already be known. We must know where we're tracing. So quickly. Process tracing is a single case research method that can be used to make within case inferences. This is not to say that we can't do multiple case studies, but it's just to say that our interest really lies in the within case um, rather than at this cross case level. And we make inferences about the presence or absence of causal processes of mechanisms or mechanisms that link a trigger to a particular outcome. And I would say that this holds two basic claims. And that is on the one hand that the claim that if we want to investigate how something works, uh, we have to study causal mechanisms. And second, that we do so using qualitative methods. Um, now, there are, in case you're wondering, there are indeed, um, let's say, uh, research streams that want to study mechanisms quantitatively. I know, for instance, of analytical sociology. I don't know if, you don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but they study mechanisms, but study it more quantitatively. And we could also imagine having a mechanism, specifically more psychological mechanisms, and kind of designing experiments for each step of the mechanism to show how it works, right? If you have a psychological mechanism, you could do that. Um, but in this case, with process tracing, we're specifically interested in this kind of qualitative approach. And Derek, in a bit, is going to talk about what that means in terms of evidence, right? Because we're not going to set up experiments. We're going to have evidence. Yeah. I've just got a comment. Uh, could you maybe slow down just a little bit? You, you've got plenty of time. You're doing great. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. It could be that and, you know, it's, it's of course, not, not, not all of our participants are... Our native speakers and and then of course also it is a there is a lot of stuff going on so thank you sure yeah i'll try i talk to you way too fast all all the time anyway so <laughs> uh, yeah it's a great reminder thanks <laughs> so it's a bit of a mirror holding up um yeah so then let's let's in some say that what we're interested in process tracing is studying the within case right so not the cross case but studying the within case and what we're interested in is kind of um, showing how things come about. We want to show how these causal mechanisms and then what a causal mechanism is. I'm going to get there in a second. Um, and we want to do so by providing qualitative information. So not numbers, but we want to show how things actually happened inside the case, which actors did what at which point in time, which kind of together brought about that particular outcome or the outcome that you're interested in. So then becomes the question, what are we tracing? The obvious answer to that is causal mechanisms, um, which then raises the question, what is a causal mechanism? And I want to briefly walk you through two definitions, which I think are partially an overlap and partially complementary. And they complement each other in really interesting ways. Um, and what you see here in the first is a definition by Renate Mainz. And she says that mechanisms are sequences of causally linked events. And uh, Maham et al. in their first part of the definition, they place the emphasis on mechanisms being entities and activities, entities engaging in activities. And both of these elements are interesting and important. Um, first, mechanisms are sequences of causally linked events. This shows that what we want to do is go beyond showing that only events occurred. Right? It's not about showing there was once event one, then the, full, the, the next event, and then the third event. The idea of this process tracing is to really show that these events are causally connected. To show that event actually caused, brought about the second event and led to the third, and that conjointly that led to the outcome. 
So it's really about showing the causality underneath it and where Mahamad will complement this definition is by saying that what we're interested in is the entities, the persons, the people, uh, the institutions that are engaging in activity so that they're actually doing something. Um, so in a very concrete way, what we want to see is say an entity literally picking something up, causal energy and handing that over to the ent entities in the second step of your mechanism. I'm gonna, we're gonna show what that means or what I mean with that in a second. But so the idea is to get at events, sequences, stories that are clearly causally linked where it's up to us to show this causality. And this causality is generally hiding in the entities that are engaging in activities. Another element here that is in both, which I find very interesting, um, is also that Mines here says that mechanisms occur repeatedly in reality if certain conditions are given. And Mahamad also said that mechanisms are productive of regular changes. So here we get back at this idea of a regularity-based process tracing where the mechanisms we're interested in occur more frequently in reality if certain conditions are given. Now, there's different ways mechanisms are presented in the literature. And there, essentially there's a different idea of the theoretical abstraction that we have of mechanisms. Um, if you're a little bit familiar with the process tracing literature, then you probably know the names of James Mahoney. And he's rather famous for what, we, what you can call the XMY model, whereby we have a cause that triggers a mechanism, which in this case really is just uh, a mechanism that leading to a particular outcome and um, putting these as almost intervening variables. So we have a cause, one step of the mechanism that explains that does get closer to what would be the explanation and then a particular outcome. If you're interested in this, there is a good example that you can find in uh, Hackett and Kaufmann. This is an article from 2012. And what they do essentially is they get at this correlation that we know exists between economic inequality and democratic transitions on the other hand. And then, of course, the interesting question becomes, how can we understand that, right? What is the link? How can we causally explain economic inequality leading to democratic transitions? And their answer is, well, this is actually, this goes through distributional conflicts. So when we see a distributional conflict, then democratic transition can occur. And this means that by adding this step, we get much closer at an explanation. Uh, but the question is whether we could get closer still. And that's the answer to that would be, yes, we probably can. And then the interesting thing on how can we do that? Well, that's actually looking at much more multi-part disaggregated mechanisms that really show entities engaging in activities. An example, first, a very abstract example. Now I've learned somewhere, I've read somewhere at some point that our brain always thinks in threes. Um, so here we have a three-part mechanism. Um, Winward, luckily, he has four parts, so then at least he proves us wrong there, he proves me wrong there. But this could be kind of a very abstract type of mechanism where you have a trigger. And the idea here is already to look at a trigger as something that is active, that is already an entity engaging in an activity. I'm going to explain that in a second. So entities, they tend to be nouns, right? They tend to be uh, things that we can categorized to a certain extent. They can be persons, they can be institutions, they can be parliaments, they can be committees. Um, they can be all sorts of actors uh, that involve in activities expressed in verbs, right? We want people to actually pick up and hand over energy to the next step. So we really want to see entities engaging in activities in verbs. Um, we're going to show uh, examples of that as well. But if you think of what regularly would be taken as causes in more correlation uh, based research, think of, for instance, democracy or low level of income. These are things that generally, in a certain way, they kind of just sit there. Right? The Netherlands has been a democracy for a long time, and being a democracy allows for all sorts of things to uh, be going on. It allows for certain entities to engage in particular activities. Um, but it's not frequently, it, it doesn't really drive anything. It doesn't put energy into the system. And so for your trigger, it would be interesting to see, um, for instance, a change of government could be a trigger. Because there we really have something that pushes energy. We can see how that starts a process and starts pushing things forward. 
And generally then, and I'm gonna show this again in the example with Windward, we want to see kind of the institutional, the social institutional conditions that enable certain things, that enable the mechanism to actually play out the way that we expect it to play out. So if this is an abstract mechanism where we have a trigger that then triggers a certain process, um, the process being defined by entities engaging in activities that together lead to the outcome, right? Where step one logically or part one logically leads into part two, logically leading into part three, and then logically explaining the outcome. Essentially what we would want is an explanation um, that leaves no how questions left. Right, so if, if you see the mechanism, you go like, ah, oh, this explains it. Now I understand how this worked, how these two things or how these multiple things, um, variables are related. So this then is Winward's actual mechanism uh, taken from his article, page 560. And I would say that there's a couple of things that go really, really well. Um, and there's two things, if I'd be hypercritical afterwards, that I'd say can still be improved to kind of show the flow of the mechanism. And so the first thing is that you can here uh, very clearly see that this is explicated in terms of entities engaging in activities. So here we have security forces that approach, right? They approach potential collaborators for information. That is a clear entity, a specific entity that is engaging in an activity. Subsequently, these collaborators, which are now civilian elites, these are the collaborators of part one, they widen the targeting criteria. So they also are an entity engaging in a concrete activity. And so this goes on until we actually come to the outcome. One thing that is very interesting about this mechanism as well is the fact that there's a little feedback loop in here. Um, I think, and this is probably also due to the way we always present these mechanisms, right? They show very linearly but that's not necessarily how things play out. Um, you can have mechanisms that propel, that, that kind of spur information. You can have mechanisms that stop. Think of, for instance, of some sort of bureaucratic mechanism where um, a bureaucrat, rather than pushing information forward, actually hides information. And so in the end, we come to a non-decision because there was no information, even though the information existed, it was taken out of the system, so to say. You can have mechanisms that stop um, that holds certain processes. And in this case, we have a mechanism that has a feedback loop. So we have activities in part four that kind of throw us back to part three because due to torture, people get into the system, they're being tortured. They give up essentially false information for the torture to be stopped, but this information leads to new arrests. So we have a further proliferation of arrests, which then gets us back to part four. And this kind of together, you can see how this spirals into at least so is the argument, into more violence and more killings. So we have a feedback loop in this mechanism, which I think is a very interesting feature and definitely something that uh, is unproblematic for process tracing to incorporate. Now, being hypercritical, uh, two things. That is one, if you look at the very beginning here, um, he casts low intelligence capacity. It's just sitting there probably as the cause. And I would here say what would be interesting is would be to have an active trigger, right? Because low intelligence capacity in central Java, taking his case, it was probably just there. And there was no problem with the low intelligence capacity until that low intelligence capacity was actually um, asked to do something. So until something was triggered in which they needed intelligence capacity, where the fact that it was low then becomes a problem. And Winward himself, he actually does mention an active trigger in his article. So at some point he says that what triggers the process is in fact the decision of security forces to implement mass categorical violence. So this process starts running the moment the security forces decide that they uh, want to essentially purge a particular opposition in this case. That's what starts it. Then the question becomes, but if that's what starts it, what happens to this low um, intelligence capacity. And here the argument would be is that that goes into the scope conditions. So the scope conditions of these mechanisms, kind of the social institutional setting in which this mechanism can play out is under the conditions of low intelligence capacity and pre-existing political cleavages. And then if you look then at the mechanism, it also explains the activities of the actors. Because it's only if you know that there's low intelligence capacity that it makes sense in part one 
for the security forces to approach potential collaborators because they don't have the information themselves. They need to get it somewhere else and they approach local elites, local collaborators for information. Now, if you know, moreover, that there's pre-existing political cleavages, it also explains why, in part two, the civilian elites widen the targeting criteria. They do so because they have essentially beef with their own opposition, right? They do so to, um, to strengthen their own power position locally in their region. And hence, they give up names that uh, do not belong necessarily on the list, but it widens the list. And hence, we see an escalation of violence, which then goes into the little feedback loop that is in parts three and four. So if we have an active trigger, which Winward has in, in the article himself, we can see how that mechanism plays out against this particular social institutional setting of low intelligence capacity and pre-existing political cleavages. And what he then does is he has the process evidence from Central Java, right? This is the case that he studies in depth, where he really looks into what was going on, who were the social elite, the civilian elites that were asked, what was the information these elites uh, gave the security forces? How did they widen um, this targeting, uh, these targeting criteria? So there he really has the process evidence. Um, but he also ventures a little bit in these two other cases. And he also shows that in East Java, the mechanism is expected to hold, whereas in West Java, this is different. So what he's doing essentially is to say here that he's theorizing this causal mechanisms to underlie a bounded but regular association. Yeah, so we see this mechanism in Central Java, but also in East Java and potentially also in other cases. And that's then what gets me back at this um, table that I presented initially in this case, where he integrates a comparative a process tracing with a comparative where the added value of the process tracing lies in discovering, opening up, showing how these things relate. So showing how low intelligence capacity and pre-existing political cleavages actually lead to an increase in categorical violence. And that's then where we can take his mechanism to show how that really works. So that truly is the added value of process tracing. So what then is really important here? Um, on the one hand, there would be theorizing activities, right? To show that entities really do something, that they pick up something and hand that on to the next part that really we, we want to see voting, lobbying, arguing, attacking, demonstrating, um, verbs, things that are going on on the floor that can really push, shove, and move um, energy and, and motion through. And the idea is that those activities would explain actually the causal logic behind the mechanism. So to really show that these sequences, these events are actually causally linked rather than just coincidentally one after the other. That would be the object of process tracing. Um, two short observations, and that's one that uh, process tracing really tends to be a much more bottom-up case-focused research approach, um, even though if you read, and I think the Winward article is already also an example of this, we tend to present studies as if they were perfectly inductive. As if we started from theory, had the whole theory figured out, then went into the empirics and then drew our conclusions. Um, that's how most articles and most books in the end are written. Whereas what's probably true is that, and this is probably especially also true for process tracing, these things are much more messy, right? They're much more chaotic. And I think Derek, you're gonna say something about it in a second when you're talking about evidence as well, where, we might have an idea and you have evidence, but then that changes the idea you had, it changes the theory and you go back to the evidence. So it's much more of an iterative process generally. Um, and with process tracing very much focused on the case and the case information with the particular strength thereby being that you really as a researcher get a very good grip, a very good understanding of your case. Um, so you really become an expert in your case, in this case, Winward really is now the expert of uh, violence in Java in general, I would say. So these are, um, call them the advantages or absolute strengths of process tracing. Um, this is the idea of what a causal mechanism is. This is the idea of what process tracing can do and what type of uh, arguments you can make with it. Uh, but then the question becomes, how do we continue? We're gonna briefly switch um, screen share, right? Because Derek will, yeah. There we go. 
All right. Um, so thank you, Hilde. Um, let me get it going. There we go. Uh, yeah. Um, and I now remember why I, I it's been too, way too long since we've uh, taught together. Uh, thank you so much. I, I look forward to doing it again and also vert, in person uh, uh, soon in the future. Um, so Hilda came in uh, and, 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 and really told us a lot about um, like the, what we're tracing and in particular, maybe a more disaggregated uh, lower level of abstraction kind of mechanistic explanation and and theory and um i sent an article that tries to kind of review the the process tracing uh literature uh to you and uh, it's still a draft so wait until it's um it's been uh, this is the second version but it's significantly updated from the first version because lots of a lot have happened uh since i wrote the first uh in, in this, the first review article in the oxford research encyclopedia on process tracing um so I'm going to talk a little bit about how do we actually trace it. So one of the things that you might notice when you read, in particular, uh, a lot of the recent literature on kind of Bayesian uh, process tracing, et cetera, is that they spend a lot of time talking about empirics, evidence, probative value, but very little time actually talking about the process. So um and and i think that's that's where what hilda was talking about it's 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 a it's a it's an incredibly important part because i think often um we we we, we move too quickly to talk about tracing uh and evidence but of course evidence empirical material is only evidence when it's evidence of something right and if you haven't told us what is the causal process and in particular, maybe a little bit lower level of aggregation, you know, just finding somebody saying something in a speech, what is that evidence of? Uh, what is the process and how does that link? How would I evaluate the probative value? Um, regarding what we're tracing, there are, of course, and, and, and Hilda really spent uh, time kind of looking at the, at, the, at the middle in this figure, kind of at the level of what are we tracing, the the this kind of more productive uh, mechanistic you know kind of unpacking it to some to some extent but there are other approaches uh and depending upon the research uh, situation there there and and your own uh, beliefs they're equally valid uh so there is both a mechanisms as counterfactual claims so this is the more intervening variable kind of way of thinking about causal processes and then there's a third variant, which is much more a kind of an, I would say, a critical realist uh, or or um, interpretivist way of of thinking about uh, social process, uh, and in particular, the argument that we the processes we're tracing are social, meaning that we also need to study empirically. Uh, not only what people are doing, but the why question, which also involves more interpretivist, for example, ethnographic methods that try and understand the game that, that social actors are playing. What is the context which in which they're, they're acting? Um, it would, it, people's motivations, you know, one thing is, is to, uh, uh, you know, on this, on this sad day, something like invade a country. But to I really understand why that's happening, of course, you do need to dig down into motivations uh, and interpretations of those and how people perceive the actions of others. Of course, uh, that's very difficult, but nobody said good social research is easy. Uh, and, and, and there's a large and, 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 and very, very good uh, methodological literature within fields like uh, and you know, ethnographic methodology, interpretive interviewing, et cetera, that, that really would help us uh, trying to capture that or tap into that more social dimension of action. Okay, that said, I'm going to focus on the, the, the two first uh, approaches, uh, the, the, the mechanisms as counterfactuals and the productive linkages. So if you believe, and notice I use the term belief, Right. So when I talk about going back to what Hilda, what, what are we tracing? That is an ontological belief, like that causation is 
for example, productive relationship of entities engaging in activities. Ontology is, is, is the realm of, of, of metaphysics. It's not something that can be tested. You can be logically consistent in your ontological assumptions about how the world works, but there's no right or wrong answer. You can claim that the, the causation is counterfactual. Great. And then, of course, you need to adopt a design that is consistent with that. So, but, but there's no right or wrong answer. And that's, that's an important point uh, to be made. I have a colleague, uh, Rosa Runhart, who, who is a philosopher of science, but is also interested in process tracing. And her argument is actually, well, both of these, to go back to this slide, both of these, so if you, if you can take the mechanisms as counterfactuals and then use these controlled comparisons as the epistemological strategy, that might be uh, a good strategy in particular types of research situations for particular types of research questions, whereas maybe in more complex, contextualized uh, settings, uh, the, the mechanisms as productive linkages makes more sense. And there, then we would do this kind of more tracing uh, within a case than, than the counterfactual comparison. But the counterfactual comparison is, is um, I think, is, is a, a relevant design. Um, and it would involve the following. So how would we trace a process? Well, in a counterfactual way of thinking of, of causation, of course, we only know causation by investigating difference. Basically, what happens when it's present and when it's absent. And of course, the perfect counterfactual situation is an experiment where we have a treatment and then a, you know, a, a, the absence of the treatment. And then we investigate the difference that that difference makes in, in treatment or, or, or control. And here, it's basically the same logic is that you can do process tracing through some form of counterfactual controlled comparisons. So this would involve finding two most similar systems kind of cases, or as colleagues like uh, Jack Levy, uh, Levy and um, James Mahoney would talk about using hypotheticals. Um, there's of course a large literature, especially international relations, talking about the use of hypothetical logical uh, comparisons. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan but that's also because my beliefs are more in the line of the, the productive account. I'm not a big fan of, of, of counterfactuals personally, but I, I recognize that that is also a perfectly valid uh, position, but I'm just not gonna use it. Okay, so in this case, we have a, 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 a very simple, more like an intervening variable kind of process. Uh, we have a case where we have yeah, presence of transnational insurgents, jihadis, and then we have increased suicide bombings. And in the article that, that Ruinhardt is talking about, um, the, the, the process is, is basically some kind of learning through watching videos uh, provided by these insurgents of, of what they're doing, uh, you know, the suicide bombings. And then the question would be, um, well, let's find a completely comparable case, the presence of transnational insurgents, but where the process did not take place and then investigate the difference that presence absence of that process uh, had for the outcome. And here, if we found no increase, the process basically broke down, then we'd say, well, uh, the watching videos actually made a difference. That was the linkage in that case, and it's causal, it made a difference. Of course, the, the big uh, Abu Dhabi in this kind of way of, uh, of, of proceeding is that it requires that you find two cases that are most similar on all relevant conditions, which of course is a very big if. Um, you know, the, the, the typical, I, I like to tease sometimes um, when, I'm, when I'm teaching PhD students uh, would, would be saying something like, well, for example, there's many, many people that might compare Sweden and Denmark as, you know, political systems. Well, they would call that a most similar system comparison only because and I'm based in Denmark, they know so little about the cases and they don't know the differences. So of course you can make a naive assumption that just because they kind of look similar, that they are similar. Uh, and in particular, what would be similar to the second Chechen case? Of course, you could not compare it to the first Chechen war because what happened in the first case, of course, influences what happens in the second 
So they're not independent and you cannot compare cases that are not independent of each other with a controlled comparison. So what of course um, a lot of people do then is, is, is they would argue for hypotheticals. Uh, and, and there's a, a literature that I, I refer to in the, in the, in the, uh, in the article uh, that I sent you uh, if you're interested in, in, in that. Another challenge though is, is, is just basically the question of what we would call modularity. So going back to the Chechen war example, in the situation where transnational, can you just take out the, that watching videos and, 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 and it still be a comparable case? And in particular, if you have multiple parts of a process, can you just take out one part of, of the, of, of, of the, without a, everything else being different? If we go back to the windward example, could you take out the part of not torturing and everything else in the case would be the same. And typically it's a system like decisions in the early part of the process influence what people are doing later, et cetera, et cetera. You can't often in a, in a, in a kind of a disaggregated step-by-step -step process, it's very difficult to argue that you could just take out part three, compare it, you know, presence absent in another case and everything else would be completely similar. Often if you pull out part three, for example, maybe the security forces who do not use torture uh, are, are also very different security forces. They're behaving in different ways. So it's not a, a, a otherwise comparable uh, process and, and context. So the modularity would basically say you can, you, can, you can take out one part and everything else is the same. Yeah, so another approach, and that's what I personally, uh, personally uh, believe in uh, and, and advocate uh, is, is thinking more in terms of mechanistic evidence. So instead of thinking about difference making and counterfactuals, we adopt a understanding of causation in which what you're tracing is a causal process composed of entities engaging in activities. And the activities are the linkages in the causal process. And then Evidencing the linkages, we see the activities, well, activities leave traces. People doing things leave empirical traces in cases. And in which case there's, you don't need to compare. I want to investigate, well, in this case, did this activity actually take place? So the mechanistic evidence is what you could call observable manifestations of activities of parts. There's a large literature in the, in the natural sciences, in particular in medicine, that talks about uh, mechanistic evidence. Uh, and I have some references also in the, in the uh, review article. Uh, that's the Clark and, and uh, Williamson uh, and, and, and others. Um, but the argument would be here that um, moving from, from the level of would say our theory, so an actor engaging in activity, or maybe a, a very dis, a very aggregated abstract process like um, the 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 Haggard and Kaufman example, but there's activities involved in that. And then the activities, what you're asking yourself first is theoretically, well, if this activity took place, what kind of fingerprints might I expect it would leave in a case? And then there's the whole uh, Bayesian uh, reasoning uh, kind of telling us. Uh, what is it, what kind of inferences would be possible in theory, uh, depending upon whether you find it or you don't find it? That would be things like you ask yourself, well, okay, I might expect to find people acting, in, you know, saying these things. Okay, well, do you have to find that for that activity to have taken place? Maybe people don't say that, but the activity still took place. Or if you find it, are there alternative explanations for finding that, that evidence? It could just be that Maybe that's not evidence of what you think it is. Maybe it's simply people, uh, you know, doing cheap talk, for example, and, and just saying things. But it doesn't really mean what you think it means. Of course, that's still at the level of, of theory, because then you have to go out and you have to actually collect observations, empirical material, and then evaluate, have I found the evidence that I think I found? Uh, and that's the working with sources, the observational process. This is an area where our historian friends are, are, are very strong, uh, where you're asking yourself, basically, can we trust the sources? Have you actually understood what this empirical material means in, in, in the evidential context, et cetera, et cetera. Let me give you uh, an example of, of what this uh, can look like. But this, so, so 
these traces then actually can have many different, basically almost any empirical material could be in principle, depending upon what activity it's evidence of, it could be evidence. And this is also how we work with evidence in fields like, uh, you know, in, 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 in criminal investigations, where we have a broad understanding of, of what evidence is, basically anything that would tell us about whether an activity took place. So this could be patterns, it could be maybe there's some kind of network that formed between actors. It could be sequences of events. It could be traces just, okay, in the lobbyist register, there's actual record that this actor and that actor met, and that could be evidence of, well, the, the meeting. Um, or it could be accounts. And that's typically what a lot of people think about as evidence in, in, in process tracing. But evidence can be a lot more, and I would say, really encourage people to think a lot more creatively about, about what in theory um, kind of fingerprints might be left by an activity in a case. So let me just show you an example of, uh, uh, from, from my own research. Uh, this is not to bang my drum, but just to, um, it just, I, think it's, I think it's an okay example. Um, and this is dealing with uh, the question of, of basically what we'd call epistemic learning. So it's in this, in this part of the process, it's basically experts like IMF officials and, and, and European Central Bank officials teaching politicians uh, and policymakers and more broadly uh, about how to understand a given crisis and, and how to solve it. And in this instance, the theory then this part is basically that uh, epistemic authorities are using both positive and negative analogies as examples to tell politicians what to do. And then the question is, well, if that part, if that activity of teaching took place, what kind of fingerprints might it leave? And here we say, well, there's some discursive fingerprints at the level of theory. And, and we, we actually try to be very specific about what an analogical justification or this activity actually would look like empirically. And here we unpack the rhetorical structure of the argument, basically, uh, and this is based on, on, on cognitive psychology uh, of kind of how the, this kind of argument in a, in, 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 in a discourse would look like. So you know, we've recognized the problem. Okay, it was dealt with in this way, in that case. Okay, here uh, we should use it because it worked there. It is gonna also gonna work here. And then in the actual article, okay, that was the in theory evidence. And then we actually have, for example, here a speech by a member of the, the executive board of the, the European Central Bank, where we think we found the evidence that we think we we were we were you know talking about as far as evidence of this activity and here you know I fear we're not learning the right lessons in Europe and then comparing with the United States and saying well it works in the United States ergo we need to also have it in Europe so that's an example of kind of this going from the level of 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 you know we say an activity in this way of thinking about process tracing an activity observables in the forms of expected fingerprints, and then the actual uh, evidence, and then discussing have we, you know, the, can we trust this source? Have we found the evidence that we think we found? Of course, discussing both the problem of value in theory and whether we can trust the sources. And then when you only have 8,000 words, how could you ever do that? Well, the, the short answer is you can't. Um, which means that I think, I think that, for example, the Windward article, also the other article that I sent as an example, and again, not to bang my drum uh, on, on it, but um, uh, is, is, is what you do is you discuss probative value and source criticism of key pieces of evidence in the actual article. So it's not enough to say, okay, here's some empirical material and this is evidence. You need to justify why it's evidence, why we can trust it, why you think it means what you think it means, and why there are not other more plausible alternative explanations for finding that empirical material. But you only in the article would do that for the key kind of, I'm gonna say smoking gun kind of, of, of pieces of evidence, your, your, your strongest pieces of evidence. And then the rest, you put it in an evidential appendix. 
that's what Winward did. And, and I think it's really, he has a really good uh, version of this. So go into the online version and you can download for free the evidential appendices. Um, I have this in this in the article that I sent around, for example, part three here, where we're talking about the activities that the institutions are doing. Um, and, and then we have an evidential appendix where we, we talk about, okay, well, what kind of fingerprints would we expect uh, to find, for example, E3B is negotiations taking place outside of normal uh, council administer or uh, pr pr uh, procedures and have a too little, too late involvement. Um, and then, and then here, uh, the, the, that can be evidence using, a, you know, talking in theory about evidence, and then the actual kind of, we, we actually take quotes from the article and then say, what are the sources we used and, and, and engage in some source criticism and also cooperation of other, other, other pieces of evidence. And of course, it, you end up where, writing an article maybe of 10,000 words and then an evidential appendix of, if you're lucky, only 20 pages. But this is no different than what you have to do when you're publishing a good experiment. I have colleagues when they when they have you know a, an article published in APSR or whatever uh, using an experiment, they might have 60, 70 pages of robustness checks and and descriptions of the the experimental context, et cetera, et cetera. So so good research is difficult. Period. Of course, this raises the question about well case selection and generalization. Because okay, so I've studied the COVID crisis. So what? In process tracing, the two types of cases that we're typically used, interested in, in investigating are, in particular, what we call typical cases. So you notice on the, on the left, on the vertical, you have outcome present or outcome not present. So in, in case-based research in general, we operate with these kind of categorical differences of kind, saying, for example, a war is qualitatively different than peace. It's a qualitatively different state, and the thinking of that as a interval scale variable with just differences of degrees might not make a lot of sense. There's a large literature, the Gertz Mahoney tale of two cultures, for example, uh, is a very nice introduction to this way of thinking about concepts. Then at the level of causes and context, so, so if we have so in the windward example, we have the cause and, and, and known contextual conditions are present. Therefore, we would expect under those conditions that the process would be triggered. Uh, that, you know, there's some kind of trigger also, that's part of your cause. Um, and then the, the process would work. Uh, so that would be what we would call, you know, outcome and cause context present is a typical case or a positive case. I mean, why would I want to, if I'm interested in the process between economic development and democracy, why would I study a country for a process linking economic development and democracy? I might want to investigate that in a country like Taiwan or, or uh, South Korea, but why would I investigate it in an underdeveloped country um, where there's not going to, the process is never going to be triggered? Right? So process tracing has an intrinsic interest in positive cases. But once you know the, the typical, once you have maybe one or more, and I'll come back to that question, uh, studies of the typical, then deviant cases, not understood as the cause is not present, but deviant cases, what we call in, in QCA terms as consistency cases, where it should have worked and it did not. Maybe the process started. And then let's say that we have the Windward article and he found a deviant case where the process actually went along. And then all of a sudden, actors decided something happened and they did not torture. And, and, and the process didn't continue, it broke down. Well, that kind of deviant case then can be very interesting for us to understand under what conditions does this process work? Maybe in that deviant case, maybe there's some uh, rule of law principles or military culture or whatever that might explain a, a difference. But you would only study the, the deviant cases that tell you a lot about under what conditions or why does it break down once you have a good understanding of the typical. Okay, 
The core challenge, and, and one of the things that, that is really difficult when we talk about process tracing, is that typically, especially when you're working with these lower level of abstraction theories, you trace the case in, in, in one case. So a lot of my research recently using process tracing in practice has been, I study the COVID crisis case and I, I find some kind of process and, and the process theory is confirmed. It, it works there. But does it work somewhere else? Does the process theory travel to other cases? And actually, I would say, and this is in relation to the regularity that, that Hugo was talking about earlier, in my cases, so I've investigated using process tracing, I think um, most of the major EU, European Union crises of the last 12, uh, 14 years. So I have seven, eight cases or something like that. I do not think of them actually as cases that are comparable. I think of them as episodes. So I have similar actors, I have, I have doing similar things, but just like in a Netflix series, I can't say, okay, I watched episode one and then I'm gonna understand what happened in episode four. I mean, it doesn't work that way. And what happens in episode one, of course, sets the context for episode four, at least in you know, kind of an episodical uh, series. Uh, so, 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 so there, the idea of generalization doesn't actually make a lot of sense. I'd only generalize to another crisis because I don't know enough about the other crises. And once I actually investigate the other crises, I understand that there's huge differences between dealing with a financial crisis and, and how the European leaders uh, dealt with the COVID crisis, for example. And this relates then into the whole question of causal heterogeneity. And then just kind of real briefly, because we want to get to questions, that you have heterogeneity at the level of causes. So different causes might produce different uh, you know, same cause might produce different outcomes in different cases, et cetera. But you also can have heterogeneity at the level of mechanisms. So the same cause, same outcome is linked to a different, through a different causal mechanism. Um, and, and for example, here, uh, this is a, 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 from an article by Ross that's, that's heavily cited, but where he talks about potential mechanisms or processes linking having natural resources and civil war. And he talks about six different processes. Of course, not all of the six different processes are just the only link. Maybe you could have a case where all six are functioning. You could have some cases where maybe only M1 and M4, et cetera, et cetera. But depending upon context. So if I find M1 in one case, how do I know it's going to be M1 in another case? It's a good question. Of course, one of the things you can do is to, to, so here, this figure, I have level of theoretical abstraction. So ranging from very high abstract one-liners to very case-specific. So of course, if you have a very case-specific theory, it's not gonna travel. You have very high, we say other things equal, high internal validity because you basically followed the money for each of the, 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 the steps in the process. So you have a, a very strong causal claim and strong causal evidence. But of course, the external validity of that claim is very, is, is non-existent. You've studied the Brazilian democratization process and great. And that's of course, perfectly valid. Sometimes we have the, and this is where the regularity assumption comes in. If you believe in regularity, then you've typically lifted the level of abstraction a bit, maybe to a detailed mechanistic theory that might work in South Korea and, and Taiwan, or you lift it up to mid-range so it works within a, a larger set of cases, or a very highly abstract one-liner. And of course, there's a trade-off between the level of abstraction or what, what uh, Satori called intention and the, the level of extension or the level of external validity or how far the, the claim can travel. But even there, there are limits. Um, so the external validity of mechanistic claims, well, some argue that you can, you, you can, you can basically do a one shot, you, do, you study one case, and then you generalize to all other similar cases. You could argue that's generalization based on hope. You don't actually have evidence that it works that way in other cases. 
And there's lots of examples from, for example, the, the more practical, you know, for example, well, great, new public management worked in one case in New Zealand. Okay, let's adopt that everywhere. And it's going to work exactly the same way. Of course, that's a generalization based on hope. Um, others would argue that we need to actually explore. So if you have the ambition to generalize, you probably have to do multiple process tracing case studies. Um, not only studying one case, but then it, you know, investigating others to explore the bounds, you know, maybe increasingly different cases. Okay, so I investigate this case. Oh, and then I find another case. Okay, it, not exactly the same, but there's enough similarities that I can say, yeah, it works in similar ways in these two cases, but does it work there? And then you start in exploring how differences in different contextual conditions matter for how the process works or do not matter. Um, but that's really difficult. That typically would also be a, a, a monograph. So let me just conclude and then let's, we have lots of questions. I'm not sure we can get to them all, but we'll try. You know, process tracing, an increasingly popular method, uh, but it's important to also be very clear about it, that it, 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 it's working with quite different types of causal uh, theoretical claims, the how it works kind of question. And then there's different, uh, different types of empirical material uh, than, than, for example, talking about average causal effects, uh, which also makes it much more difficult to go between a more variance-based, you know, for example, an experiment and findings from an experiment to something like uh, process tracing. Okay, I will end there, and then um, I will maybe queue it up first for Actually, is it all right, Hilda? Do you have a question you want to? Because I think one of the early questions was the whole post positivist. Uh, yes, and I've, uh, whilst you were talking, I've been answering some questions, but I also took some questions explicitly to discuss afterwards because I thought they would be too difficult to explain in the chat. Yeah. So I actually noted them down. So I have a list of questions that we can already answer. Okay, so maybe I, I just start with the one and then and then I'll, I'll give the floor to you to take take the next. So um, there was some questions on post positivist process tracing uh, securitization theory, um, of course, is maybe a, a more specific theory theoretical framework to couple with process tracing. And that's a huge question. Um, in the in, in the review article I, I linked to the to the work of Norman. Uh, for example, uh, Puyo, uh, Guzzini, um, do talk about more kind of interpretive process tracing. I actually also personally have an article under review that talks about social process tracing, where we try to combine more interpretivist um, methods for, for, for collecting experience near evidence of activities and the social game that actors are playing and then, and then more experience distant, kind of what are they doing? Kind of, um, but it's, of course, it's a different type of, um, well, first, it's a, it's, a, it's very different ontology, which of course then leads you to, for example, a very different epistemology that you start using more hermeneutic uh, interpretive methods uh, as one example. It also often has an implication for the, um, the type of theory itself. So, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of, of the late uh, uh, Lian Fuji's uh, work, uh, and she has a fascinating, really disturbing article about um, why people, um, you know, would, would, would join and, and take part and participate in, in genocide in the Rwanda uh, context. And in that article, she talks about processes and mechanisms, et cetera, and has a great theory but you don't see it kind of unpacked into these, these you know, very clear uh, parts. And I think that also has to do with the more, some of the ontological assumptions about uh, fluidity and relationalism. So if you really believe that social processes are social, well, those are, the interaction is, it's, it's continually ongoing it's, it, and it's relational. And that makes it very difficult to, to, to theorize in a, uh, in a way that is, um, is very, you know, kind of sequential, uh, which means that, that, that Leanne Fuji in her, her article, for example, simply doesn't, doesn't depict that kind of, of, of theory. So, um, 
I think that kind of variant of process tracing, a lot of the things that we're talking about in particular, kind of moving from activities to evidence, some of these questions, the source criticism, some of that is relevant, but how we actually kind of what we're actually tracing and how we trace it also is different. And that's important to, 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 to recognize. I think it's, 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 it's also really important for me to say that uh, even though I write about one type of process tracing, that doesn't mean that there are other understandings. As long as they're consistent and in alignment with their ontological assumptions, it's perfectly legitimate and fine to take another position on what is the nature of causation, for example, like our in more interpretivist uh, colleagues uh, would do. Okay.